Hello, and uh, welcome to everyone joining this uh, panel discussion, Shipping, uh, Collaborating Across Industry and Supply Chains to Reduce Emissions. I'm Charles Goddard. I'm Editorial Director at The Economist Group uh, and also Executive Director of the World Ocean Summit. Um, while it is, and we've been discussing this in another uh, session, while it's essential to focus on um, developing and finding uh, new zero-carbon uh, fuels and new technologies to uh, radically decarbonize shipping, and of course there are 60,000 ships running on uh, on fossil fuels out there at this point in time, with another 20, many of them having another 20 or 30 years of life in them. Um, uh, this really challenging long-term aim uh, should not, I think, stand in the way uh, of uh, more immediate solutions to um, reducing carbon emissions and to tackling this question of carbon emissions in the here and now. How can this best be done? Uh, and how indeed is it being done at this point in time? Because we have, we are making some progress in uh, that direction. And to help us uh, talk that through, to discuss and debate this question, I am joined by five uh, distinguished and uh, experienced panelists. Let me introduce them. Craig Jasensky, uh, Group Chief Executive at Wilenius uh, Wilhelmsen, Scandinavian roll-on, roll-off, um, shipping and logistics company, uh, Jeremy Nixon, um, chief executive of One Line, a container shipping company, uh, Sadan Kaptanoglu, who is uh, president of BIMCO, um, an association, an international association of ship owners, uh, Elizabeth Munk af uh, who is head of supply chain and sustainability at uh, IKEA, uh, the global home goods company, uh, and Julian Proctor. Uh, Managing Director and Portfolio Manager N at Entrust Blue Ocean for Impact, um, a, an investment uh, fund for uh, green shipping and the blue economy. So let's begin. Let's jump straight into this. And I'm going to start, if I can, with Craig uh, Jasinski. Um, and let me just ask you, Craig, uh, as a starting question, given that shipping's regulators, shipping regulators have their sights set on reducing um, uh, the industry's emissions, um, why is it still important? What what is the you know what sense is there in uh, collaborating, as we say, across uh, industry sectors and supply chains uh, to reduce emissions? Thanks, Charles. Yeah, look the 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 challenge that we face is enormous. I'd just like to start with that. If I take just as an example for us in Roro shipping, one vessel in one day is requiring the same amount of energy as about 40,000 average households per day. And we operate 120. So the energy challenge just to start with is enormous. So then when we translate that into the need for a significant reduction in emissions, it's a huge, huge challenge. So why does collaboration, why do we believe collaboration is so important, particularly in the supply chain, is that in today's world, we have a supply chain, which is at least in our world, in rural shipping, is fundamentally driven by three metrics, time, cost, and quality. We're missing that fourth dimension, and that's about sustainability. What impact does the supply chain have in shipping uh, on sustainability here and now? And, and we'll talk about this, I hope, during the panel, but there's a number of actions that we think we can take immediately to reduce that energy need and to reduce the emissions. I mean, since we are, since you just mentioned that, let's jump in quickly and just tell us one or two of those actions so that we can get some framing of that as we move into the conversation. Yeah, we, we have, uh, and I'm, I'm fascinated to hear more from Elizabeth because I, when I caught her title that she's responsible for sustainability and supply chain, uh, that, that resonates extremely strongly with us. We, we have an operation where, you know, 80% of our revenue on board a ship is coming from 20% of our customers. Our customers are represented by the world's automotive manufacturers and heavy equipment manufacturers in principle, if I start with that. We live in a world which is what we call the hurry up and wait scenario. So given that we're pressured on time uh, and frequency in the supply chain, what we're often doing is applying a lot more energy, therefore a lot more emissions, to rush product to a holding center so that it can sit there for 90 days. It's almost ludicrous. So one of the first steps we think that we can make is to extend the time in the shipping supply chain and take that time away from inventory. 
And in an hour, in the industries that we serve, that inventory time is is quite long. And one of the core drivers of that, uh, Charles, is is the fact that we we still have a a, a traditional model of reaching wholesale targets uh, in in these particular sectors. So we need to move away from wholesale target setting and look at that, as I said, that fourth dimension of, of what is the actual sustainability impact in that supply chain from an outbound perspective. So it's sort of ironic, isn't it, that the car industry was behind just-in-time uh, manufacturing uh, in so many ways, and yet the end product, a car, sits at the you know sits in a large holding pen um, uh, for mm-hmm. ninety days at the end of the process. Um, I, I mean, just just briefly, what would be the impact of reducing that time um, in that holding mm-hmm. pen on carbon emissions, and how would it impact carbon emissions? Yeah. So if we're able to, we, we've talked a lot about speed in the industry. So as a catch-all, if we could reduce the average speed of, of global fleets, we'll reduce emissions. And that, that is a correct statement. Uh, that's, a, that's a whole new topic in itself uh, because it's not equitable between the different types of or sectors within shipping. But if I just focus on Roro, if we're able to reduce the transit time, let's say reduce the average speed of the fleet on a consistent basis, uh, we're able to take out um, easily take out 20, 30% of our carbon emissions overnight by still reaching a reasonable delivery time, um, but working with the manufacturers to reduce that time uh, in inventory before it ends up as a retail sale. So that's, that, that's an immediate impact that we, we can start tomorrow. Mm. Okay, well, it's good to good to to know that. Let's come back to that, I think. And Jeremy Nixon, could I come to you? Um, your uh, container set of container shipping, uh, your alliance of container shipping companies, and the problem is slightly different, I think. But what is what is it that um, you know? And, and indeed, how serious are your customers um, in uh, decarbonizing container shipping services? What? You know, and, and I guess that uh, we'll come to Elizabeth in this process as well. But you know, to what extent are you getting that pressure from from your customers? Uh, overall, fully fully concur with a lot of Craig's points. Uh, at the end of the day, on the container shipping side, we offer a global network, 140 countries in the world, with about 10 diff- 10,000 different routings of cargo options between different inland points and different ocean ports around the world. And I would say historically, the discussion with our customers has been around. Either what is your cheapest price or what is your fastest transit? And those seem to be the two elements that have been part of discussion for a long time. But I'd say in the last five to seven years, as the environmental developments increase, uh, a lot of clients now also saying, okay, you could tell me, please, the lowest cost routing, tell me the fastest transit routing, but also please tell me the lowest carbon footprint. Uh, in, in terms of routing. So we're starting to get in that discussion now. So we could see some kind of trade-off between cost, transit time, and carbon emissions. Still at quite an early development stage. But I think our clients are very serious about it now. And, uh, you know, we were obviously a little bit concerned during the pandemic that a lot of this would get pushed back on the back foot uh, about the environmental debate, but it's, it's certainly back on again. And things as we're going to talk on, I'm sure, very soon are very, very topical and very high profile now amongst the IMO about what is going to be the regulatory framework that we're all going to face over the next 10 to 20 years in terms of how we go about decarbonization. But we're a member of uh, something called the Clean Cargo Working Group, which actually uh, Elizabeth's part of uh, with IKEA. Uh, and and also, you know, also Wally Nies is, is also members of that. And we have about 60 major customers and about 20 carriers. And in that forum, we are actually divulging and, 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 and producing our carbon footprint emission data and sharing that uh, between those parties so that we can better improve and understand where are the pinch points on, on the carbon footprint. So I think it's a serious issue. I think it's gaining momentum. I would just say, though, that, of course, our customers want all the carriers to do it tomorrow in terms of decarbonizing and to do it for free. That would be the starting point. As we will go on to discuss, it's not easy to do it tomorrow. It's going to take a long time. And secondly, doing this kind of stuff is not for free, which we'll go on to talk about as well. I mean, the two, as you say, run slightly contrary to each other. On the one hand, your customers wanting you to, uh, you know, wanting 
everything in terms of the, 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 the excellence of logistics that you supply, the speed, the frequency, and so on and so forth, at the same time wanting sustainability too. How, I mean, just give us an example. We, we know, we've heard about uh, slow steaming uh, in, other, uh, in other parts of uh, the World Ocean Summit discussions. Is that the primary kind of focus that you're going to be uh, looking at in terms of at least the short-term uh, reduction in emissions? Is that the, the, big, the yep. big tactic? Yeah, exactly. So there's a short-term issue about how do we de decarbonize what we've got? How do we reduce our carbon intensity? And then the second point is, is where do we go to to completely get rid of carbonization, you know, and, and go to yeah. decarbon solutions? So we're working on a dual track. We want to work on the long term and we want to work on the short term. The short term, there's no doubt about it, as, as explained. I mean, uh, if we can reduce our speed by 10%, we, we will save, you know, somewhere around 15 to 17% in terms of our immediate fuel consumption. So just just working through the Archimedes principle and how ships move. And uh, it's a bit like sticking your head out of the window in a car. You know, at 30 miles an hour, you can do that. As you get to 50 miles an hour, it starts to really push back. And by the time you get to 70 miles an hour, you can just feel the weight of air against your head. So it's very much along those, those principles as well. But slowing down, of course, has a consequence. Because if you slow down, then you can't maintain the same amount of frequency. So for us, typically on the East Europe trade, we'll have 10 vessels operating, you know, on a 77-day round-trip sailing, covering maybe five or six ports in Asia, covering three or four ports in, 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 in Europe. But of course, if we slow down the network further, those 10 vessels can't get round on a weekly basis. So we need to start injecting more ships, bring in an 11th ship or a 12th ship or a 13th ship. So we need to be cognizant that if we do slow down, we may also have to add more assets so that may also have to be built into that, that, that carbonization equation. So let me come then, thank you, Jeremy. Let me come to Elizabeth, um, uh, uh, Elizabeth Munkal, uh, uh, Aphorism Schold, and uh, ask you from IKEA, are you prepared to accept uh, a different and effectively slower schedule in, um, in, in container shipping? And do you recognize and to what extent this conversation going on about the recognition that there is going to be a significant new investment that needs to be made by um, by shipping companies in additional ships if there is going to be a, a slower schedule. How do you frame all of this um, in your mm. in your in your clean cargo uh, coalition? But first of all, I'm happy to, that we're having this discussion. Um, and in, in IKEA, we we have our people and planet positive strategy. Uh, and we are committed to uh, become climate positive by 2030 throughout our value chain, which means that we want to reduce more greenhouse gas emissions than our value chain actually emits. Uh, so, so even if we are going to sell more product in a very positive upward going curve, we need to reduce the emissions, the absolute emissions in a, you know, going steeply down. And, and for supply chain operations, where I'm leading sustainability, our target is that we need to reduce the carbon footprint from every transport that we do by an average of 70%. And we need to reach half of it by 2025. So we have very ambitious targets in this area. And if we look at our carbon footprint, from transportation, from the suppliers to the warehouses and stores, it's about 1 million tons per year. And approximately half of it comes from ocean shipping and the other half from land transportation. So if we are to reach our targets, it is, of course, very important that we find the solutions for the ocean shipping. And here we also believe that it is through collaboration we can achieve this together. Okay, so I, I just want to, I mean, because we talked about collaboration and uh, collaboration across the supply chain, I want to just try and quickly understand your, your understanding of that. What do you mean by collaborating across the, the supply chain? What practical uh, sort of outcomes are you looking for across the supply chain that will reduce carbon emissions uh, in the near mm. term? I think... First of all, I think it's important to have kind of a common picture of what lies ahead. 
a common map. What? Because there are different pathways into the future. And all of these pathways come with different sets of challenges and, and also opportunities. Uh, and I think right now uh, there is not a kind of consensus and probably there not be a consensus completely, but a clearer picture on the pathways. And then I believe what is important for collaboration is trying to slice the elephant because this topic, it's complex. There are lots of different perspectives. There are lots of investments that need to be done. But I think it's important to, to slice the elephant in a bit here to more manageable projects uh, and that we have can create this kind of lighthouse projects that can show the way to the future. Uh, and I think this kind of collaboration is, is key to, to establish. Thank you. Let, let me, let me um, we'll, we'll come back inevitably to one or two of those points. But uh, if I could come to you, um, uh, Sadan, uh, Captain Oglu, um, on, uh, from BIMCO, the International Association of Ship Owners. And what, you know, try and give us the perspective from the ship owners. Um, uh, what, you know, what is your journey? Why is it important to have a journey towards zero emissions from your perspective? And uh, how, do, how are you thinking of slicing this, this elephant? Um, thank you so much, Charles, and hello, everybody. Um, uh, first of all, before me, two of our fellow ship owner uh, speaks, and uh, I just fully agree with them. Uh, and also this shows that, and I think also for the rest of the ship owning community, I can say that, you know, ship owners, 100% committed to decarbonize the shipping. I think it is the commitment is very important because this is a as is said before is a huge and complex task. And what what is the ship owner's responsibility? Uh, I think the first responsibility of the ship owners is buying more efficient ships, and this is a challenge on the way of decarbonization that we must solve. Uh, why? Because there is 60,000, as you say, very rightfully charged, there is 60,000 uh, ships in the world using fossil fuels. And, uh, and this is impossible that over one night we can decarbonize them. Because also the technology uh, for decarbonization is not widely and commercially available for all types of ships and all types of trades. Uh, so that's why also, you know, collaboration is very important. This is not going to happen overnight. And also we do not want to, we should not want to uh, happen this overnight for a very simple reason. To actually try to recycle 60,000 of the vessels before their time is simply waste. And also waste is uh, is harming our, you know, uh, planet as well. So we have to be very careful we need to be very balanced uh, on what we are doing. So, uh, so can I, I have to say that... Yes, no, let me just come in. Let me come to you in a second, yeah. Jeremy. But I just wanted to follow up and just ask you a little bit more of a specific question, and that is, um, you know, when we are talking about the reduction in emissions that we need to achieve over the course of the next five to ten years... Um, before we see some of these newer technologies hopefully uh, emerge, um, what do you uh, you know how how do we get all of the stakeholders to own part of that um, you know own part of that responsibility? I think it goes first of all for every individual. Forget about we are ship owners or you know any business persons, but it individuals. You know maybe we are not the. Uh, first generation who actually pollute the world, but we might be the last one who save the world actually. So we all have individual responsibilities. That uh, so the collaboration to me is not only from the sector or the charters or the ports, you know, refineries, flag states, but from every individual. Why? Because there is there is a, there must be a commitment to continue to decarbonize shipping. And before I go further, I just have to say one thing to clear the air because, you know, uh, Craig and Jeremy is there both uh, from the liner sites. And then I want to talk about the, you know, the spot market and the, the vessels, we are, they are not liners. 
and and they look like a, actually taxi. And what do shop owners do? You buy the taxi, you hire the taxi driver, and then you wait for your customer. And the customer comes, it is different than the cars, the customer comes and decide where to go and how fast we go. So that's why collaboration between charters is also vital. So one of the challenges that we're facing here is the complexity of the shipping sector as a whole, the fact that there are quite a lot of different business models that are in the shipping sector, and it's not going to be easy to create a standardized set of regulations, it seems to me, to address each of uh, the concerns. But let's come on to that in a second. Jeremy, you had a quick, I hope, a quick intervention there. What, do you have a thought? Yeah. Yeah, Charlie, I mean, just, just just cutting to the chase here. I think, you know, I, I, it's very, very clear to me that the great, great majority of ship owners, ship operators, charterers are really, really committed to resolving the environmental issue and are pushing hard for change. And we have some technological issues about how do we build decarbonized ships in the future, which we'll come to. But in the immediate short term and leading up to 2030, I think a lot is being done, not just in terms of slow steaming on the backhaul, but also looking at you know design of ships, changes in terms of engine designs, propeller systems, paint systems. You know we're spending a lot of money. All of us are spending a lot of money, and we are seeing improvements. So like the cargo working group, we've seen like a four percent improvement each year in reducing our carbon intensity per ton mile. And I think those there's a lot of progress going on. There's a lot of commitment to do that. Uh, the issue is about how can we then you know, accelerate that further, and particularly on around the new technology and the new playing field. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you. That's a, that's, that's uh, a good way of framing, I think, the discussion that we're having. But let's jump, shall we, to uh, Julian Proctor um, and uh, your focus around this. Obviously, you're investing uh, in, um, in companies and ship owning and operating companies through your fund to... Can, can I just ask you how... How, how, to what extent um, uh, do uh, these companies believe that um, they can profitably decarbonize their, cons- their customers' supply chains? And, and this is really the major question. And just to give you a sense of the importance of this issue to institutional equity investors and lenders, we're at fever pitch. The the number of asset owners, asset managers, which have now very clear and announced decarbonization strategies is material. We only heard from BlackRock uh, recently in the last several days regarding their very clear objectives to decarbonize their portfolio. And this is flowing throughout the entire industry that the businesses that they invest, and predominantly in the ocean industries, because it's much bigger than just container shipping or or RORO, or these sectors, it involves food production, renewable energy, passenger mobility. It's a big industry. It's about $6 trillion. So we've got some very big players in these industries, which these institutional investors are deploying their capital. And they will make very clear decisions which companies they will ultimately invest in, and which ones they won't, which ones they may divest from. So there's going to be very clear, and there are very clear actions being sent to those investee companies that they need to very clearly embed these climatic risks into their business model. Now, if we look at one of those supply chains, because we have uh, people from the, the liner business and also the row business on the, the call, container shipping, for example, ultimately it's a supply chain which involves customers like uh, IKEA with, with, with Elizabeth, and ultimately it also involves owners at the other end of the spectrum which own the steel, which ultimately a business like Jeremy would utilize. The fundamental challenge in that supply chain becomes how does the uh, investor in the steel, the ship, earn a return on his capital? And he can only do that if Jeremy makes a profit. And then Jeremy has to turn around ultimately to Elizabeth and say, well, I have this increased expense because that's what my lessors are now incurring. How can I pass this on to my customer as I care? And, and this is fundamentally the collaboration, which which I think was being discussed right at the beginning, but for an institutional investor, this is the critical question. Can you earn an adequate return on capital? And B, also there's other investors, lenders, let's not forget those. Uh, in terms of the marine industries, debt is by far the most important part of this sector. There is also very clear movement 
mobilization of bank lending towards lower carbon shipping. You've probably read very much, Charles, about the Poseidon principles amongst many other voluntary schemes. But what this all shows you is whether or not it's equity, whether or not it's debt, there's a material and substantial amount of capital which is being much more thoughtful in how they will allocate and the businesses to which they will allocate. If those businesses do not have sustainable and environmentally and socially, I'm already assuming they're going to be doing the right corporate governance, environmentally and socially focused businesses, then they're not going to get the capital. They will not grow. And ultimately, they will have to exit the industry. So I think this is very much similar to uh, maybe not a Kodak moment, but very similar to what the oil and gas industry has been going, over, going through over the last 10 years. We're going to see substantial change. And, and, and certainly as relates to the people who will allocate their capital to the industry. And how do you refer, um, you know, Julian, to this question of the, the short-term decarbonization of shipping? Because you're, you're, you're looking, it, looks, it sounds like you're investing in the longer term, uh, you know, sort of fundamental transition and transformation of the shipping industry. And you're expecting your, um, uh, your potential clients, the, the people you're investing in, to, to look at that question. What about the short-term decarbonization of shipping? What about short-term reductions? So we'll come to you maybe, in. Craig, just before you, you uh, your answer, if I may. Yep. For us, it starts with having shareholders and management teams which embed these values very much in their culture. So to the extent, let's talk about operators, because there is very much a conflict between operators and owners uh, sometimes. If we, if we think about operators which have got those values and very much are mindful of those climatic risks, and what they mean and how they are thoughtfully thinking through addressing those climatic risks. For us as an institutional investor, that is incredibly valuable because ultimately we want to have people, management teams, boards, which are very mindful, but have also very clear roadmaps for how they're going to achieve short-term objectives, but also some of the longer-term objectives. Because we're pragmatic. We understand that there is no silver bullet right now for some of the very hard to abate sectors, such as dry bulk or container. If the discussion was in ferries, I think we would have a very different discussion because there's technology in these easier to abate sectors, which can be deployed certainly on shorter uh, distance travel routes. So I, I think it really depends where you are, but it all starts with management. It all starts with the board's attitude and values. Thank you. Let's let's move straight to Craig, and then I know that Elizabeth wants to come in as well. Craig, your thoughts. So, thanks, Charles. Yeah, actually, I want to tie together a point that Julian uh, made, and and we, when we talked earlier about speed, uh, just very quickly on speed, to have speed as a catch-all solution for all sectors of shipping, uh, we don't think is equitable because what happens in such a case is those owners and operators who have invested heavily in highly efficient vessels. Uh, will actually be penalised, and Jeremy was a little bit into that. But just moving away from that for, for, for a moment, if we come back to the, the impact of speed in the supply chain and just look at that as, uh, individually for our business, uh, we've just launched uh, a concept called All Cell Wind, which is a wind-assisted or wind-powered uh, pure car carrier, so capable of lifting over 7,000 vehicles. It's, it, we're not the first one to come out with a wind solution, uh, but, but this is a solution that we're testing commercially and operationally uh, to the point that we consider this to be viable and on water, uh, hopefully within 2025. That vessel uh, is going to come at a significant investment impact to, to, to Julian's uh, earlier point. So we need to generate the, uh, the, the capital needed in order to invest in such a technology. The impact of that ship is we can sail across the Atlantic as a good case example at approximately 10 knots. That's a speed which is about six to seven knots slower than what we currently do today. But an emission, a CO2 or a carbon intensity impact of more than 90%. So it's, it's real. It's a huge impact. It's going to cost us a lot of money to get there, but we've got to do it. And this is why I started with the point that bringing sustainability targets into the, uh, one of the metrics of the supply chain is so key. Uh, to, to the challenge that IKEA is facing with a million tons of carbon emissions in transportation. Uh, they need to be serious, and I know they are. I know you are, Elizabeth, serious about ensuring that you're measuring the carriers to do that. Then we're encouraged and we're motivated to make those investments. And to Julian's point, I would hope 
that we'll find investors that are willing to back it. Elizabeth, you were you were going to add add your thoughts yes. to that. I just want to reflect on this about short, mid, and, and long term actions. Um, I think there is such an importance not only to talk about the big transitions that need to be made, but also because of the urgency of the, the climate agenda to also look at what efficiencies can we work on here and now to curb the emissions. And Jeremy was, was talking about lots of these different measures. There is still such a big potential in, in, in uh, enhancing efficiency. And in, in IKEA, we're working with, with our, what we call our three R's, reduce, replace, and rethink. Where reduce is really about capturing all of these efficiencies, which of course directly also reduce the carbon impact, but also the cost, and then replace is about replacing two alternatives, um, like like uh, alternative fuels, and we think is about integrating innovations. But I think it's so important that we really talk about the efficiencies and not just focus on the transition that needs to take place. We need to, to discuss those things. It, it, they are of equal importance. So... I, I just want to, if I can, get a little bit specific here, because I'm still a little bit sort of in the dark about what some of these efficiencies really are across the supply chain. Could you could you just sort of describe to me what, what some of those efficiencies look like? Um, for example, it is about enhancing equipment utilisation, uh, which is something that we're working on a lot, which has big reduction potentials of, of um and uh, reducing the carbon emissions. It's about enhancing planning. Uh, it's about capturing the potentials there are in the digitalization area and all the, these different technical solutions that there are. So there are lots of things that we can do. And also working, for example, with the clean cargo, measuring the, um, the, the carbon emissions, we can also see that working with efficiency has a clear impact on the carbon emissions. So there's a lot that can be done here and now to enhance the efficiency. Um, and just a, a, a point, if I may, uh, Charles, I think Elizabeth just communicated incredibly well, and I think it created to the kind of messages, clear messages, that in institutional investors need to understand how management teams and boards are addressing these issues because what i feel uh, and this is not necessarily critical to the industry but across the the ocean industries there hasn't been a good enough job communicating what these operational efficiencies and improvements are and how they can be achieved and ultimately when you said where do you deploy your capital it's in discussions like this when you have somebody who can clearly communicate how to do it makes the difference between this company getting the capital and the other company getting the capital. Thank you. Saddam, you had a point. Uh, I was just you know, going to a little bit echo Julian, though. But I have to say, you know, it is, it is very encouraging to hear someone from ICAO that is this much, you know, determined. What is really important here is that we have to increase the number of determined parties in this conversation and so that, you know, we can reach out even more people. And from the shipping perspective, you know, Jeremy and Craig will know as much as I am. We've been doing a lot of things. And uh, in that sense, now we have to also from the IMO, the short term goals, and we need to measure them well, and we are all together, you know, tackling with them. And we want to keep this uh, whole uh, short-term measures uh, global and practical. And also, you know, ship owners are proposed IMO a research fund, actually, which will boost the innovation. Because I agree with Jeremy, and you know, I'm uh, amazingly following also Craig what they've been doing. Uh, regarding the innovation, but everybody is doing their bits on their own corners. We have to bring them all together. And, you know, to actually invest on new buildings is one thing, but we also have to tackle with the existing fleet. There will be conversions, you know, there will be other technologies. So that's why we need a research fund also, uh, so that we can focus on, because it is clear that on the 
throughout of the carbonization. And even with the collaboration, there will not be one solution. There will be plenty of solutions, but it will be in a way complexly uh, regulated, I will say. Not maybe the short-term measures, but the long-term measures will be, you know, uh, it must be this way. Thank you. Well, can I can I just pick up on that because you know one of the uh, one of the questions that's been sort of sitting there in the background and uh, Craig, just I'll come to you in a second. Um, and Jeremy, uh, you mentioned is that you know what is the regulatory framework um, uh, that uh, we're going to get uh, around decarbonisation, particularly now in the short term from the IMO as it studies its regulations to be released in 2023 uh, around this and this question that you raised earlier. Uh, Craig, around um, the le the level playing field, um, and you, you you hinted at what the challenge was. You've you've just invested in ships that are, you know are designed to sail fast, um, and uh, and and then if these regulations somehow don't uh, create a level playing field across all the different sectors, uh, it will uh, it will potentially be unfair. So, can I just unpack that a little bit and ask the question: How is the um, IMO going to be able to judge how to create a level playing field across such a complex sector. Um, perhaps, Jeremy, I could come to you and then uh, uh, Craig yourself after that. Well, thank you, Charles. First of all, I think we're very, very lucky to have the IMO. We have a single UN body overseeing the whole regulatory side of our industry, which is quite unique. Uh, secondly, that they have set quite a high bar in terms of the decarbonisation leading up to 2030 and then the eradication of, of carbon solutions by 2050 and some very, very high hurdles that we all have to jump over. And that's very positive as well. It now comes down to the how. And uh, of course, we're now looking at things that around design of new ships, looking at the existing efficiency and carbon intensity of existing ships, and at looking at how to reduce the operational efficiency, uh, carbon impact of the existing assets. And of course, we will, that will encourage many of us to start developing new ideas. But I think really just coming back to Craig's point and other points, we have to avoid stranded assets. We cannot afford to go out on a limb individually and build and design solutions and then find out three, four years later that they don't fit the regulation or they don't work. So this comes back to the collaboration point. We need to work together. We need to raise funds together for R&D. And as Sedan indicated, Actually, the IMO, we're looking at trying to work with them to create a self-tax on the industry of a certain amount of, uh, you know, a certain amount of dollars per ton of fuel oil, which we would impose on ourselves, collect centrally, give to the IMO and create this research and development board where we could create three to five billion dollars worth of funds to start developing a lot of this jointly rather than individually trying to design our own solutions. So I think there's a lot of really good things going on, but we've got to get it coordinated and we've got to get it really off an even platform over the next four to six months. So I'm not sure that everybody would agree with you, Jeremy, that uh, the IMO is setting the most ambitious targets. But let me let me just kind of come back to Craig and just say, Craig, well, how 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 do you see this? Uh, you've 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 been concerned, I think, about this question of level playing field. What the IMO is absolutely. I, I think. Thank you, Charles. I think Jeremy explained it actually extremely well. And I think the key thing here, as I talked about it before, relative to speed, it's the how do we get there? And we're a firm believer in some type of market based measure. Uh, Jeremy's point was very much about how do we create the, the R&D funds that Saddam was into uh, in order to collaborate better as an industry. We fully support that. Uh, but when it comes to actually the how does the industry change, uh, the simple catch-all, as I said, for speed penalises those that invested. Uh, we've managed to reduce our carbon intensity by more than 38% since 2008, only through investment and scale uh, uh, size of ships. But uh, just a simple speed reduction will help, definitely, but it penalises. So we need some type of carbon-based uh, pricing. We need some type of market-based measure, which is equitable across all the different se sectors of shipping. That's what we think is very important from a regulatory perspective. But I also, uh, I won't take long here, Charles, but I just wanted to catch one point that Elizabeth was talking about as well. And we feel very strongly about this need for uh, the players in the supply chain, the customers themselves, uh, to also look at how do they measure us, as I said, adding that fourth dimension of sustainability to the procurement choice. Some of the very simple things that we've already done and we have done in the industry, Saddam was talking about the recycling of vessels once they age. 
Uh, we started the Ship Recycling Transparency Initiative a couple of years ago. The sole point of that initiative, it's free, it costs nothing to join, uh, but it's simply a transparency organisation to identify those companies and ship owners that choose to recycle their vessels green and those that choose not to. And for a, for a typical customer to make a procurement decision on choosing a carrier that opts for green recycling as opposed to not green recycling, it costs nothing. It's a simple choice, but it just needs to be measured. And as long as it's not measured, we're not going to get that shift in the industry. And that is today, I think, still one of the things that we should not be proud of in shipping is that the vast majority of global tonnage is not recycled in a green and sustainable way, but it should be. We will shift quickly as an industry if our customers demand that from us. So uh, just picking up on these these points, I mean, this question of uh, equi an equitable sort of level playing field across all the different shipping uh, sectors, is this something, Julian, that you, you see, and then we'll come to you, Sadan, um, uh, you see as being important? Well, just before answering that question, Charles, if I may, I want to pick up on something which Craig, I think, mentioned regarding the the right data, the right indicators, the right information that end users, customers uh, need or may want to consider when evaluating the service providers that they have. And uh, clearly, it seems to be that there's an enormous amount of pressure on the very large end users like the IKEAs the, and, and some of their competitors across many different supply chains at a board level, how far that is being pushed down into the operations of the business uh, to me is unclear and whether or not the incentives at the operational level are in a place whereby uh, people on the purchasing side of the business are incentivized to include metrics like carbon as in addition to cost and reliability. I think something which uh, needs to be considered potentially more. Uh, because ultimately, when a uh, a business like uh, Wallenius or Juan is having those discussions, uh, I think that that interface is incredibly important. I am encouraged that there are certain freight aggregators which are now using internet-based platforms to provide data not only on speed, reliability, cost, carbon efficiency, but we're very much at the beginning of that journey. But I think this... This communication of data, having the right incentives at both the end user, the operator, and ultimately the owner, all the way through that supply chain become incredibly important. Otherwise, you can have different parts of the supply chain uh, synchronizing with the wrong things. And therefore, you miss that overall collaboration. Uh, so, so I just wanted to make that point very clearly because even though I think we're getting a lot of pressure at the top of the board, I'm not sure how far it's getting down to the operations. Uh, a, a good point there. Sadan, you, you, you wanted to jump in. Um, yes. Before that, can I just uh, say one thing? Uh, maybe some people will not agree why IMO is so important because some people really do not know the procedures we have to go through for global framework. And when you talk about IMO, you are talking about uh, 174 member states and, and all the stakes in shipping needs to agree on a global framework, which is very important. And we have to keep things global. And because regional, uh, any incentives will not good for shipping. Uh, because it can be as an example of different uh, other regional, uh, regional uh, I would say, you know, uh, measurements, and that will be dangerous. But having said that, you know, now as BIMCO, when we look at this situation, uh, we are hoping that research funds will be, you know, uh, taken on board by IMO in July, hopefully. And we have the short measures to tackle. I mean, uh, last 10 to 15 years, shipping comes so far to developing innovations. And I think it is time for us also to think ahead. You know, we are talking about uh, decarbonization, two decades of, you know, finding the right uh, uh, innovations. And also that, which means that these two decades, there will be existing vessels, you know, uh, fuel, fuel fuel vessels, and the 
new fuel vessels operating in the same market. First of all, definitely we should allow this. This should be, you know, uh, facilitated, but to by keeping the level playing field. That is really important. So uh, what we are recently discussing in BIMCO, that I think it is time also for f future references. We must start to discuss about market-based measures globally. But I have to stress out globally. It must be global in order to be efficient. Thank you. And in order to create a level playing field, I guess. Um, uh, let me um, just come on. Uh, we've got a, a short amount of time left. I just want to come on to something that you mentioned earlier, Elizabeth, and that is this uh, sense that it's not just uh, a task of innovation in technologies, but a task of innovations in partnerships, in a sense, and innovations in collaboration that are going to make some of these changes matter and some, some of them make them make some of the outcomes meaningful. What did you mean by that exactly? Um, I think um, we're talking a lot about innovation and technologies and the different solutions. I mean, lots of the solutions are already out there. It's about how do we deploy them and how do we get the speed in this? And I truly believe mm. there is to think about how do we do innovation and how we collaborate with each other. I think right now we are all in consensus here that collaboration is the way, it's a key to successfully drive this agenda, but it's about how do we do this collaboration? Where do we start? Which forums? Who should collaborate with whom? Because it's not, I think, that everyone in the whole industry needs to have a consensus and then we go all together hand in hand. But I think there is a need to start a multitude of different projects to really move forward. And it's about, that's what I mean also with slicing the elephant, make more manageable projects that we can work on. We are very interested in working in pilot projects and also in how we can deploy different solutions. So it's really about how we connect with each other to make that happen. So, Jeremy, can I just ask you to reflect on that as well? Is it about how we slice the elephant, taking up elephant, taking side, you know, chunks that we can deal with, and thinking uh, in an innovative way about how we partner? Yeah, I think you know if we can if we can get a sensible outcome with our regulators and get to one uniform regulation, and this is just one of the concerns that we may see some regional variation. With amongst the regulators. And that gets very difficult because we're a global business, so we need to move the assets around free and easily globally. We can't have these regional fiefdoms. But if we could, if we could set the level playing field in terms of the regulations and clarity around that, I think that there's a lot of collaborative collaboration op opportunities coming up. We talk about developing this R&D fund, which we could all tap into. There's a lot of different forums going on, sustainability centers now setting up. Uh, a number of us are on these international advisory panels looking at cross-industry, cross-mode opportunities to, to collaborate around ship designs, around future fuel types. And we need that because fundamentally today, we don't have enough of technology and knowledge yet of how to scale up to the decarb solution. So things like you know, hydrogen, things like ammonia, methanol, et cetera, we know the science behind it, but applying it to 100,000 ton ships and doing that in a safe way and having enough fuel to do that needs a huge amount of collaboration with the energy companies, with the ports and terminals, with the shipping companies, the charterers, and ultimately our cargo owners as well. So there's a lot to be done. I'm quite positive about it, but we need to get that absolute clarity in the next six months, exactly how these regulations are going to play out and make sure they're uniform and we don't break up into this regional fragmentation, which will only make it more complex. Julian, I can see you nodding there. What does the perfect model for you for collaboration look like across uh, uh, the supply chain? I think Jeremy said it incredibly eloquently. I know we're short on time, but I will say, I think the EU is uh, playing a really instrumental role, especially with the Green Deal, it's providing the uh, catalyst and I think the big push which the IMO needs. And I will say to the lighthouses, because I love the analogy of lighthouses, if we can show success in, uh, in ferries, in some of the shorter sea areas where you can decarbonize quicker, maybe that gives us the, the confidence, maybe that gives us a little bit of a kick to be able to do it in the deeper sea as well. Thank you.
So very quickly, we have two comments finally. Sadan, can I come to you? What are your lighthouses here then? As I just pick up the, two, the term from Julian, your lighthouses. I think my lighthouses uh, will be finding the level playing field. I am sorry, but I have to insist on that because otherwise we will, and also to keep it global. These two things is important. And as long as we can have these two, we can always find a way to uh, collaborate. Thank you. And Craig, just a final word, the level playing field, that's something that concerns you a great deal. Is that, is that, is that really the, you know, the key issue really? It is. And firstly, a, a big here here to Jeremy. Uh, he said it perfectly, as did Julian. Uh, I think the key for us from a lighthouse perspective is that collaboration with the actual users of the supply chain of shipping uh, to add that fourth dimension in their procurement decisions, and that's sustainability. Well, thank you very much to everybody. We uh, seem to have, uh, as Sadan said, we seem to have arrived at, arrived at quite a lot of uh, consensus around the table here about what needs to happen in collaboration terms uh, in the short term as we move to try to reduce uh, carbon emissions in our shipping before we see uh, new technologies and fuels come into place. I just want to thank Craig uh, Dzenski. Um, from uh, Wellenius, uh, Jeremy Nixon from OneLine, um, uh, Sedan uh, Captain Oglu from uh, BIMCO, Elizabeth Munk, uh, Af uh, Rosen uh, Rosenschold from uh, IKEA, uh, and Julian Proctor from Entrust Blue Ocean. Thank you so much all for joining us and thank you for your thoughts.